pleasure for the course on behalf of the um, of the course um, organization, and uh, it is a pleasure for me to be in the head of that of that program tonight. I would like to uh, give the floor to Professor Hassan Manna to offer this honor uh, to present it to Prof. Samir Ansari. Professor Hassan. Thank you so much, Professor Sa. Uh, really, dear uh, colleagues, really tonight we have uh, a ceremony. Uh, the organizing committee of uh, Anesthesia Mega Online course and uh, all of the attendees and the panelists are celebrating with our course legend, Professor Samir Al Ansari. Of course, we have in Egypt symbols and leaders we are proud of. Of course, in politics, science, arts, and etc. I consider Professor Samir Al Ansari is one of the symbols and the sure one of the leaders in anesthesia and intensive care in Egypt, and sure in the Middle East. No doubt his experience and presence in our course adds a huge and great value. Actually, from my deep heart, I wish for him long, long life full of happiness and health, Prof. And on behalf of the group, Please, Professor Ansari, accept a very simple appreciation from our group, the shield of excellence of the Mega Medical Academy. And I think the best person in the academy who deserves to introduce this shield is Professor Saab Mahdi. So please, Dr. Saad Mahdi, introduce the shield for our eminent and expert professor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you much, Professor Assam. I can't say any more after you said what you said. Uh, really, the accreditation of this course basically um, came first for uh, Professor Samir Ansari, who offers uh, to lecture with us and lecture through this platform to everybody, it was a great accreditation, and he gave us what you call resuscitation for that course, um, life kiss for that course. Whatever you say is not been enough for Prof. Samir Ansari. I'm really overwhelmed by his uh, giving. Uh, so far, in uh, 26 episodes in the course, we have received nine lectures from Prof. Samir Ansari. Whatever we do, is not enough to say thank you very much for Prof. Samir Ansari. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> really, uh, really, I uh, I am highly happy from this appreciation. But I want to say something. My appreciation uh, already received. Already, Dr. Saad received since you give me chance to participate with this highly educated and highly polite team, and this famous construction, which I hope to see it as a huge construction all over the world, inshallah. You are really a good family, a good members, a good friends, and a great offer for me, and the world is are greater, greater than my caliber, really. I'm highly happy from this appreciation. Thanks for you. Thank you very much. You make now, I think I can't uh, deliver my lecture from this emotional uh, situation. Thanks for you. Thanks for all. We believe that, Prof, that we are born again today. That course is starting again today. And thank you very much. The <laughs> second... Prof, uh, uh, we are so proud of you, Prof uh, Ansari, and we considered your <laughs> lectures uh, as references for uh, many, many people in Egypt, in Middle East, and all over the world. So. Uh, we would like to appreciate and thank you for your effort and your endless best all, uh, all the time. Thank you, Prof. The second, uh, uh, on behalf of the, of the course organization, I really wish in a position uh, to, be, to give um, uh, an honorary um, uh, 
uh, appreciation for every lecturer in the course. But the second um, um, appreciation is getting to uh, Abrof Makarita and uh, Dr. Mayada Yahya is going to introduce it. Assalamu alaikum, good evening everyone. I am Mayada, lecturer of anesthesiology and the intensive care at Azhar University. It's a great honor and pleasure to attend this mega online presented by our distinguished doctors, professors, Dr. Samir Ansari and Dr. Maharita, who updated us with valuable information and enriched our skills by their experience. I would like to thank them from our, from my heart with deepest, dearest, uh, valuable, informative, uh, and uh, amazing literature of you. Thank you, Dr. Maharita. Thank you, Dr. Samir, for uh, yes. you really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for both of you. In Arabic word, Jazitum al Jannah, inshallah. Dr. Hisham Abdul Maksud, uh, would you like to add anything, please? Yes, of course. Uh, I would like, of course, on the behalf of every uh, attendee, uh, before uh, the panelists uh, to thank uh, everyone uh, who participated and who uh, uh, gave us even uh, small minutes of his uh, precious time uh, to complete the uh, nice picture and uh, uh, give this work uh, the uh, ultimate and complete uh, uh, picture that uh, it's appearing now to everyone and this uh, work uh, I believe that it will not only be, be beneficial to uh, the attendees who are attending and of course getting a lot of benefit to this uh, but it will be also uh, be, uh, beneficial and of great 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 uh, uh, help to uh, the next generations of uh, our uh, juniors and uh, doctors, anesthetists, uh, intensivists, and uh, pain doctors uh, from the coming generations, inshallah. Dr. Walid Ashwa? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, will, I will say words uh, and feelings lives 100 years beyond our lives. And uh, however we use uh, words to... Uh, to tell about Professor Samir Al Ansari or Professor Muhammad Makarita, we cannot get them their rights. So uh, we appreciate so much uh, your support, Professor Samir, and your uh, support, Professor Makarita. Thank you from all. Thank Professor you. Professor Makarita, if you please, uh, Dr. Saad, I'd like to introduce something uh, about uh, Professor Makarita because he is well known uh, an uh, expert in anesthesia and in uh, pain management in Egypt. Uh, he well known by his uh, great efforts in the uh, field of uh, pain and his experience in pain. And he is well known uh, uh, everywhere in the universities of uh, Egypt and also in the Middle East. And I think he's uh, making a great, great, great effort in the uh, Egyptian Society of uh, Anesthesiologists. So uh, I'd like to appreciate his uh, job and uh, introduce his, uh, him uh, and say thank you, Professor Maharita, for your effort. And uh, inshallah, everybody will get benefit from uh, your uh, lectures and uh, all the uh, mega academy uh, as reference for the, all, the whole anesthesiologists all over the world. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish I, I, I'm in a position to give um, to give a, 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 speech, a speech to every panelist and even attendees. Uh, I would be very happy. Uh, Prof. Samir, do you want to say anything? Uh, I, want, I want to say something, yes. Uh, I suspect and I hope and I am sure your mega course will be the most famous one, inshallah. Thank you. Much, the world. Please your effort and with your help and with your uh, hard work which you uh, uh, <coughs> spend in this field. Thank you. Good much, luck for all of you. Good Thank luck you for all of you. Thank you. I would give the floor to Barbara Roger, our guest from Ohio. 
دكتور انا عايز اقول بس شكرا ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور يور كايندنس يو نو اور ريليشن تو يو بروف ماكاريتا از مور ذان فريند اند مور ذان جزاك الله خيرا جزاك الله خيرا وجزيتكم Thank you very much for coming from Ohio to uh, introduce in this course. And it is another milestone to be across the transatlantic to reach Ohio through Barbara Roger. All yours. Welcome, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Mahdi, for giving me the opportunity to be involved in this wonderful course. Um, our first lecture is, um, as everyone knows, Dr. the eminent Dr. Samir El Ansari, Professor of Intensive Care Medicine. Hello. And he's going to talk about muscle disorders in the ICU. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Do you mind, please, if we take the question after each uh, lecture, because it will be easy for video editing. Okay, so when Dr. Okay. Elvin Sari is done, we'll take like four questions out the yes, chat please. box. Yes, okay. please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barbara, for this nice introduction. And uh, good evening, our colleagues, and good evening, and welcome our attendees. Uh, I am going today to speak about uh, some of the common problem in the ICU, which is uh, muscle disorders in the ICU. Uh, really, we uh, all the muscle disorders in the ICU share the same uh, problems or the same uh, considerations like how to diagnose or difficulty in diagnosis and how to manage and the restricted uh, uh, routes of management and so on. Uh, today I am going to just highlight the most common causes or most common underlying disorders which, which we face commonly in the ICU. Uh, of course, if we start from up, from the central nervous system or maybe brain injury or maybe spinal cord injury and going down to nerves, maybe some sort of disease affecting the peripheral nerve like Barry syndrome, critical illness neuropathy. Uh, also neuromuscular junctions as Mycena graves, butyless, tetanus, in the muscle ending to the muscles, uh, we can see polymyositis, myopathy, intensive care myopathy, and, and, and we, I think, we know there are many diseases affecting the muscles and affecting the uh, neuromuscular uh, unit. And uh, as mo uh, most of us know, there are many, maybe more than 600 diseases affecting our nervous system. And so the differential diagnosis really in this field is highly difficult. And the diagnosis also may be difficult to some extent at start. Uh, we have uh, to, and also even the facilities or the lines of treatment is restricted and highly costly. Uh, if we start with uh, a common disease, which is uh, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, and uh, as we know, this disease is uh, maybe diagnosis and the management of it may be complicated. And its clinical presentations and disease course are mostly heterogeneous, as we will see. And so the international clinical guidelines are currently available for depend on some literature, depend on case study, depend on some expertise, and so on. It is an acute onset, always starting acutely. And some cases, some start with chronic, with chronic presentation. The acute onset is, uh, starts with ascending sensory motor neuropathy affecting the periphery first and going up. And it is an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradical uh, neuropathy and mostly demyelinating, but some items or other types affect the axonal uh, nervous as we will see. It is a rare disease, but potentially fatal disease. And it is immune mediated disease 
of the peripheral nerves and the nerve root that is usually triggered by previous infections, even subclinical infections, some uh, uh, infection with influenza, maybe cytomegalovirus infection, uh, Epstein bar virus, some pneumonia, and, and even, even with vaccination, especially vaccination uh, against influenza. Uh, it started, uh, the body started forming antibody against the ganglocytes, which reside at high density in the axolem and other component of the peripheral nerve, and also in association with complement activation and the infiltration of macrophage and edema are typical characteristic of affected peripheral nerve and the nerve root in patient with Guillain-Barré syndrome. Uh, there are uh, 10 step approach to diagnosis and management of uh, Guillain Barre syndrome. Uh, if we start, if we look to this figure, it simplifies actually how to diagnose, how to proceed, and how to manage this disease. And I think we have to apply these steps in most of the muscle diseases. And the most of the uh, our talk today about Barry or about botulism or about another disease, it, I think, applies to most of the muscle diseases which you face in the ICU. How to diagnose the uh, Barry syndrome? It is a rapidly progressive bilateral limb weakness, and it, is, uh, it may include also sensory, sensory nerve affection and also maybe hyporeflexia. Most of the cases except in the hyporeflexia, a hyporeflexia or areflexia, as in Miller Fisher. Uh, also may extend up and causing some sort of bulbar palsy and the facial nerve and the cranial nerve affection, uh, causing of salmoplegia and ataxia. How to diagnose, Barry? Check the diagnostic criteria. And the most of the muscle diseases, I, we apply these points also. Exclude other causes of the muscle disease. Consider routine lab test and the CSF examination specifically in a Barry syndrome, it will show us increased, uh, in most cases, increased protein, may be normal in the early stages, but after that, we'll accept an increase in the uh, protein level in the CSF. But the cell is uh, not, not uh, no, there is no increase in the cells, there is no bilocytosis. Also, the other lab tests must be done to exclude other uh, causes of the muscle disease. See, uh, electrophysiological study, this must be applied in any muscle disease. Uh, we can see the latency of, of action potential conduction. We can see F wave. We can see many characteristics for the or both the titanic potentiation, both the titanic inhibition. It, it help us in differentiation of the different type of muscle disease. Because muscle disease really, it may be difficult in diagnosis uh, sometime, uh, especially in the early stages. I want to admit the patient to ICU when the patient is starting to accepting some sort of respiratory impressment or he is going to respiratory failure or respiratory stress or the patient becoming to accepting progressive weakness and severe autonomic. Severe autonomic dysfunction or dysautonomia is one of the commonest uh, factors uh, which causing us to admit the patient to ICU because it, is, it's, uh, it causes high mortality. I want to start the treatment for the patient. Really, there are different uh, opinions in this field. Some prefer early uh, intervention, especially by plasma pheresis or by infusion of uh, immunoglobulin in such cases. Others ask to wait till some weakness or some evidence of the disease becoming uh, clarified and becoming evident. Treatment options in Paris syndrome, as we know, it is limited and it is restricted to intravenous immunoglobulins, 0.4 gram per kg daily for five days. For uh, children, we can uh, give this dose over two days, not five days. Uh, some prefer it and some prefer over five days. Plasma exchange also the dose 200 to 250 ml per kg, per kg for five sessions. And the, some ask if we can repeat this treatment if the patient accepting slight improvement or accepting not dramatic move. Yes, we can repeat after some times in some patients who are accepting some deteriorations after initial, the initial treatment. Monitoring also, as, as in, in many muscle disease, we have to uh, 
record the muscle strength uh, or the, the progress the respiratory function, especially by through spirometry, vital capacity, force and expiratory volume, uh, different uh, pulmonary function tests to evaluate the progress of the disease. Also, we have to look to the swallowing functions and this and the difficulty in swallowing or getting rid out of secretions is in, especially in cases of cranial affection of the uh, barium. Also, the autonomic functions is very important. And as I said, this autonomia and uh, severe arrhythmia in some cases during evening position of the patient or moving the patient, accepting fluctuations, severe fluctuations in heart rate, blood pressure, uh, also, they may complain of bladder, bowel control problems, and so on. Uh, we have to look also to the complications, especially early complications in Barry syndrome and also in any muscle disease. Right? We have to be ca careful for DVT, prophylactic anticoagulant to avoid DVT for the, those patients because they are not ambulating and the muscle tone is low and the DVT is common. Also, we have to look to for choking and aspiration and atelectasis and so on. So we have to guard against and we have to intubate the patient early. Uh, infections also is very common, especially pulmonary uh, infection, uh, deep venous thrombosis, pain in some stage of the disease, most of the patient with Barry syndrome suffering from some sort of muscle pain. Also delirium and the depression, very common in all muscle disease and specifically in Paris syndrome. Urinary retention, constipation, corneal ulcerations where we have to protect the eyes and take care of the eye. Dietary deficiency, very common and very common in ICU to see a patient with malnutrition which predisposed to critical illness, myopathy and the cachectic myopathy which may be difficult to do, differentiate from Barry syndrome in some situations. Pressure ulcers is very common and it depends on good nutritional state and also in positioning of the patient, physiotherapy, hemodynamic state, all these factors affect the development of pressure ulcers in those patients. Compression neuropathy, very common in such patients because basal tone is very low and they are liable for compression. Limb contraction, and so we have to move the joints and to ambulate the patient and to participate with, uh, uh, ask the help of physiotherapy for, uh, to avoid these complications. Uh, monitoring as uh, we, uh, we, uh, we covered that, clinical progression is very important with treatment and we check if the treatment giving us a good result or we have to repeat or it is not optimal. And <laughs> repeating the treatment, but some, as I told, we sometimes repeat the treatment if there is some response and if we suspect the, there is progression of the inflammatory state of the uh, Predicting outcome and long-term care, it is very important also, especially in the Barry syndrome and in all, in all muscle disease patients, especially the psychological state and the lifestyle after that. Most often, un unremarkable, unremarkable infections precede the, uh, the Barry syndrome. Uh, most of these patients are complaining, especially of Campylobacter jejuni. Can be in a quarter of our patients, they suffering from previous Campylobacter infection, Zika virus, as we hear before, cytomegalovirus, mycoplasma pneumonia, Einstein by virus, influenza virus. And some vaccination, especially against influenza vaccine, mostly influenza vaccine, some patients and some vaccines accepting this. Absence of antecedent illness doesn't exclude a diagnosis of Barry syndrome. Suppose the patient is not suffering from previous infections. This is not meaning the patient has no Barry syndrome, may, no, may be some sort of autoantibody or autoimmune reaction to other factors. The recent drug is usually began abrupt and especially the distal, uh, distal and uh, symmetrical in most of the cases. 
and uh, start also with paresthesia and quickly followed by progressive lymph weakness. Progression is rapid really with, uh, with 50% of patients reaching clinical neither by two weeks and most than or more than 90% by four weeks. If I find my patient developing weakness and paresthesia and, and before within 24 hours or after four weeks, this is not Barry syndrome and I have to search for another cause of the problem of, <clears throat> in such patients. Always it takes from two weeks to four weeks to give me the full picture of Barry syndrome. Before 24 hours or after four weeks, uh, except in the patient morbidity, after four weeks, this is not Barry syndrome. In patients who reach maximum is disability within 24 hours of disease onset or after four weeks, alternative diagnosis should be considered. 80 to 90% of patients become non-ambulatory during the illness. Pain is prominent in 50% of patients. This tells symmetrical weakness. Reflex is decreased, reflex action is decreased or absent in most patients at presentation and in almost all patients at me. Most of the patients, except in some, but I want to say Barry syndrome is highly difficult to disease in its diagnosis because there are, as we will see now, there is an overlap, overlap in the symptoms. It is not distinct symptoms or accurate symptoms, or we can't say it is consists of paresthesia or ascending or descending or cranial only or dysautonomia, no. We have in many patients uh, a different figure of presentation and the diff different pictures of presentation as we will see now. Although Barry syndrome is essentially a motor neuropathy, sensory dysfunction is seen in more and few patients. And sometimes we say we see sensory manifestations only in very rare cases of Barry syndrome. Facial or pharyngeal weakness is commonly seen in Barry syndrome. Diaphragmatic weakness also due to phrenic nerve involvement is also common. Dysautonomia is one of the most problematic uh, uh, complaint in Barry syndrome, hypotension, hypertension, arrhythmia, tachycardia, as I said before, just you manipulate your patient, moving them from side to side, he may be arrested in front of you and so take care of this autonomia and, and some other diseases, muscle disease, excepting this, this autonomia. And I think you saw it also in acute cervical injury and in spinal cord injury. Axonal subtimes of Guillain-Barré syndrome uh, may be manifested as a pure acute motor axonal neuropathy, just the motor nerve affected, or acute motor and sensory neuropathy also we can see. Uh, it is caused by antibody which attack the gangliosides at the axolemma of the nerve and also participating with complement activation and the invasion of microwave to the axolemma and causing edema of the nerve and, uh, uh, and, even, and in some other types, demyelination of the nerve. About uh, quarters of patients with Barry syndrome had before, had uh, Campylobacter, Jejunal infection, and so try to check this micro. Diagnosis progressive weakness in both the upper and lower extremity within four weeks, along with areflexia is essential requirement for diagnosis. And elevated CSF protein concentration with normal cell count, with normal cell count not exceeding 50 cells per milliliter. And so no paleocytosis and Barry syndrome. But suppose you find that, 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 that tabbing the protein level is low. Maybe you can't exclude. You can't exclude the Barry syndrome. Uh, as you see here, the pattern of symptoms in variants of Guillain Barry syndrome, we see many different patterns. How about, about 25 or 30 patterns, really? This, uh, this pattern, I just uh, summarize it. We can see the cl uh, classic sensory motor affecting in you know, a motor and the sensory nerve affecting the body or the body. Maybe a pure motor only, and it may be paraparetic. The patient to look like paraplegic. Sometimes we think it is a spinal injury and <clears throat> causing the motor and the sensory affections. 
We can see also the area of the bulbar area or the pharyngeal area with cervical and the brachial and arm weakness and sensory loss in the upper arm and also with dysphagia and uh, weak coughing and so on. It could be in another picture, the bilateral facial palsy with paracysia, paracysia in the distal area of the lamps, or maybe pure sensory, and it is very rare, pure sensory. Rare. Or in the, in the form of Miller Fisher syndrome, which consists of, of salmoplegia and areflexia and ataxia, three items. Of salmoplegia affecting the eye muscles and also ataxia, ataxia and <coughs> areflexia, no reflex action. If, the, if this type lost consciousness or if they are becoming drowsy or affected the consciousness or becoming not concentrating also, it will be Becker stuff brain stem encephalitis and the pyramidal area or the brain stem area will be affected. This is a simplified figure to show you the Barry syndrome is not a destined entity or not easy in its diagnosis. There is an overlapping symptoms and signs and so its diagnosis may be difficult in some cases. Becker stiff brain stem encephalitis also usually present with symptoms resembling Miller Fisher syndrome, which consists of salmoplegia, ataxia, and areflexia, in addition to loss of consciousness and brain stem dysfunction, including impaired consciousness and the pyramidal tract signs. A feature required for diagnosis it is in Barry syndrome, to be sure it is a Barry syndrome, progressive bilateral weakness of arm and the legs, initially only legs, may be involved, absent or decreased tender reflexes in the affected limb, pain is prominent in 50% of patients, relatively symmetrical weakness, symmetrical weakness. Uh, progressive, this is the most figure or most characters of Barry syndrome. Progressive phase lasts from day, uh, days to four weeks. Relative symmetry of symptoms and signs. Relative mild sensory symptoms and signs. Cranial nerve involvement, especially bilateral facial palsy. Autonomic dysfunction, muscular or radicular back or limb pain. Increase the protein level in CCF. Normal protein level doesn't rule out the diagnosis. Electrodiagnostic features as latency and delay in conduction and if wave and so on, this characteristic to Barry syndrome. But we have to raise the red flags and we start to think in another problem, not Barry syndrome, if we find these points. If the fever is at a, present, a patient present with fever at onset of the disease. If there is severe pulmonary dysfunction with limited weakness at onset. If there is severe sensory signs with limited weakness at onset. If there is persistent bladder or bowel wall dysfunction or bladder or bowel dysfunction at onset. Or sharp sensory level, maybe spinal injury. Or marked persistent asymmetry of weakness, always Barry syndrome, symmetric. Lab also increased number of mononuclear cells in CCF or polymorph nuclear cells in CCF, market bilocytosis, and in such cases we have to send in another problem, maybe some infection, HIV, cytomegalovirus, maybe leptomeningeal malignancy or other underlying cause at lymphoma and, and carcinoma. We have to send in another problem, not Barry syndrome, if we find this point in the patients not asymmetric, patient suffering from uh, fever at start, patient suffering from uh, sharp sensory level, and so on. The reason syndrome is a monophasic illness, and although so many patients can deteriorate after first stabilizing or improving with therapy, sometimes you give a treatment and plasmapheresis or uh, immunoglobulin, and the patient accepting some improvement and then deteriorate. The treatment-related fluctuation, we call it treatment-related fluctuations. And in such situations, we have to repeat the treatment. We have to push the treatment again, better maybe. And the relapses of GBS can occur in one to 5% of patients. And if it is relapses more than two or three times, I think it is, will be a chronic inflammatory demyelinating symptom. Uh, Becker stuff brain stem encephalitis, as I told, it is mostly due to uh, it is like Miller Fisher syndrome, also uh, included in Barry syndrome, 
uh, which is diagnosed by areflexia, ataxia, and ophthalmoplegia in addition to some pyramidal affections or loss of consciousness. And in such situations, maybe there are too much antibody against or too much an antibody against the gangliocyte in the axial lemma of the peripheral nerve. There is another figure or another uh, disease entity of the berry, uh, which is acute ataxic hypersomnolence. The patient coming with drowsiness and uh, coordination problems mostly, but uh, no muscle weakness can be detected. This is called acute ataxic hypersomnolence. And so we saw how much this disease is difficult because of its overlapping signs and symptoms. Bigger stuff, brain stem encephalitis uh, characterized by rapid onset of, of some ataxia, areflexia, and the disturbance of consciousness. Recurrent episodes have been reported. MRI abnormality in the brain stem have been reported in 11%. It is often overlapping with sensory motor variation. What is the management of Berry syndrome? I think it is not for the pathology and the description of the disease as, a, as I told that first we have limited limited uh, tools to manage such diseases. We have all the intravenous immunoglobulin and the plasma phoresis and it is very important for management but actually the management of complications and the management of the disease itself and the progress and the sequel of the disease in any muscle disease not only in Barry syndrome is very important. Avoid DVT, avoid bed uh, ulcers, avoid uh, good nutritional support, or good psychological support, avoid depression, avoid delirium, avoid avoid many complications in the patient suffering from muscle disease. And it is it common, uh, common manifestations. The most important item in management of muscle disease in general, and the Barry syndrome specifically, is intubation indication. If your patient has accepting inadequate ventilatory effort. If your patient is accepting poor, poor airway protection, you decrease the level of consciousness and these level to aspirations and atelectasis and the pneumonia and, and potential for neurological deteriorations, we have to intubate. And don't forget 20, 30, 40 rule. 20 vital, vital capacity. If the patient is accepting less than 20 cc per kg, vital capacity, you have to intubate. If the patient accepting less than 30 cc per kg, maximum inspiratory, uh, sorry, 30 centimeter water, maximum inspiratory pressure, you have to intubate. If your patient accepting maximum expiratory pressure, less than 40 centimeter water, you have to intubate. This is 20, 30, 40. 20 for vital capacity, 30 for maximum inspiratory pressure, negative inspiratory pressure, and 40 for maximum expiratory pressure. 20, 30, 40 rules. But really, really, we don't depend in, in muscle disease on spirometry or pulmonary function. We depend mostly, as I told Solus, on clinical, don't wait to measure, don't wait to make blood gases. Your patient will not accept in the hypercarbia except in the late stage, except in the dying stage. He will accept in the hypercarbia. Don't wait for uh, deoxygenation. The muscle the Barry syndrome or the other muscle is not manifested by deoxygenation. Deoxygenation and the hypercapnia and you, you, uh, are a late signs in muscle disease. Don't depend on such investigation. You have to depend on your clinical sense. You can find, you look to your patient, he can't swallow, he can't cough, he can't raise his head, muscle power is low, muscle power, you have to arm it yourself and intubate your patient. Plasma phoresis, the early and the I told them, really, really in, in most of the research uh, and in our experience, as early as possible, plasma phoresis give you a good prognosis and a good risk. And even in the stage of paralysis, if you predict the Barry syndrome in the stage of paralysis and the start patient just coming to you after some infection and the complaining of some paralysis and some weakness, weak weakness, you have, if you start plasma rapidly, your patient will be recovered rapidly. 
Five weeks exchange about 200, uh, 250 mL per Tg over 10 days or over five. Uh, intravenous immunoglobulin, as I said, two gram per kg over two to five days. In children, we can uh, uh, carry it in two days only, and adult in five days. Some pediatric prefer over uh, two days. Uh, some advise plasma phenesis for intravenous immunoglobulin, not so if, uh, efficient and costly and not, uh, not effective. Even if it gives you some, maybe some slight improvement, I think not, uh, not, not, not battery or not beneficial. A steroid treatment is not beneficial in Paris syndrome. Steroid treatment not beneficial in Paris syndrome. Not been about, but it carry its complications, osteoporosis, uh, infection, immune suppression, and so on. Also, an acute cervical injury and the spinal cord injury. Don't give it no need for it. Treatment related fluctuations, uh, treatment related fluctuations indicated that the treatment effect has worn off while the inflammatory phase of the disease is still going. And so we can, as I told, we can repeat our plasma phoresis or repeat our intravenous immunoglobulin for such patients. Autonomic uh, dysfunction or dysautonomia, as I told, it is very common and very uh, catastrophic complications and uh, lead to high range of mortality and so take care of this autonomy and try to treat it. These are important complications of Barry syndrome and even most of the muscle diseases is the most common complication. Uh, choking, uh, cardiac dysrhythmia, hospital acquired infection, pneumonia, renal tract infection, bulbar and facial policy, immobility, bladder dysfunction, mechanical ventilation, pain and the tactile arrhythmia, depression, renal retention, corneal ulcers, all these complications are common to all muscle disease, not only for Barry syndrome. Uh, I shift now to another problem in ICU, which we face, which is tetanus, or uh, which is caused by cholesteridium tetanus, and as you know, it is which is a locked jaw syndrome, and causes obstonus after that, when the, when the back muscle is contracted, and the start is, as you see, is just with a wound here, infected wound, an anaerobic area, anaerobic medium, for growth of cholesteridium tetani, and then start the muscle of the face starting to be tonic, and the patient uh, suffering from locked jaw and rises sardonicus appearance, and after that, and becoming impressed in breathing. And this is a wound here. Uh, endospores then can be introduced in the body through a puncture wound, especially, especially the rusty. Rusty nails and anaerobic area or urine area and agricultural area and wet area, all these uh, carry the cholesteridium tetanus, which causes uh, tetanus or causing uh, which harbor the anaerobic bacterium cholesteridium Even patient with heroin users, they can inject themselves with heroin and causing some sort of tetanus. It can carry the rusty nails. Surgical procedure also intramuscular injection compound fracture, dental infections, animal bites, all these can cause, uh, can cause uh, tetanus because it incorporates, if not clean, co uh, co incorporates the cholesteridium tetanus. Signs, symptoms, and tetanus often begins with mild spasm in the jaw muscles, also more locked jaw or tresmus, and then the facial muscles become contracted and give you appearance of rises. Uh, sardonicus and the tetanus and the tetanus toxin or tetanus was being specifically blocked the release of neurotransmitter GABA and the glycine from inhibitory neurons. And so the muscles stay in a state of contract, contraction. And so we saw many patients really suffering from generalized tetanus. And such a patient, I, I advise if you face patient in the ER coming with you with generalized tetanus, don't hesitate. Make tracheostomy. If you can't intubate, proceed. Or even if you can intubate, proceed for track because this patient will stay in the ICU more than one month because he accepting severe contractions and the, uh, I think, intubation for a long time, it is carry its complication and its hazards. And so better to tracheotomize this patient from the start. With the help, of course, of benzodiazepine, any muscle relaxant drug and also with muscle relaxants, 
and the proceedings are this state. They are better for the patient. Because such a patient, even when you come in front of him, when you speak to him, when you touch him, he becoming the attacks of contraction. The, because the inhibitory, inhibitory pathway is inhibited by tetanus toxin or by tetanus spasbium. And so no relaxation of muscle, no choline sterase actions after uh, the acetylcholine action. And so the muscles stay in a contracted state. It's very painful and very, and, and may cause fractures in some, in some patients. And so this, but it not affect the consciousness and the patient is fully conscious. Other symptoms of tetanus may include sweaty, headache, but also this autonomia and increased heart rate, decreased arrhythmia, hypertension, hypotension, all these manifestations could be detected in tetanic patients. Onset of symptoms, of symptoms is typically three to 21 days following infection. And maybe more than one month, the patient incorporating the bacterium and do not manifest it except after a long time. But mostly within three to 21 days, the patient becoming a manifesting of the disease. Recovery may take months. And we saw patients that take several months to recover from this disease and actually the, the patient who recovered in ICU from tetanus explain or clarify how good this ICU. Because these patients need every sort of support in the ICU, hemodynamic support and nutritional support and physiotherapy and, and this patient need highly specified care in the ICU. A recovery may take months. About 10% of cases prove fatal, really it is a fatal disease if not treated uh, Accurate. Uh, diagnosis is based on the presentations, the tetanus symptoms, and doesn't depend upon isolation of bacteria. Even if you're not, because which is recovered from the wound in only 30% of patients, not every patient uh, <coughs> you can't isolate the bacteria from. And they can be isolated from people without tetanus. Some people have harboring their organism, but in the gastrointestinal tract. There is test, very simple test really for diagnosing the uh, tetanus, a spatula test. Just a wood, you can introduce the tongue depressor inside you as a patient and the touch that uh, you will provoke the convulsions and the locked jaw. The ordinary response for a spatula test, if you introduce something, the patient will gag and vomit and the cough and so on. But in such a situation, the patient will start to beating the spatula and uh, you inside the contraction of the face muscles. And even, I said to you, even not, not the patient not waiting this spatula test, the patient just you speak to him, any stimulus, just to touch him, he will start contraction and uh, uh, severe contraction, which persists for minutes. And it is a, a repeated contraction, so not only one time. Incubation period and incubation period of tetanus may up to several months, but it's usually about 10 days. And this is the rule, really, the farther the injury site is from the central nervous system, the longer the incubation period. The longer the incubation period. The farther the injury site is from the central nervous system, the longer the incubation period. The shorter the incubation period, the more severe the symptoms. Uh, types of tetanus, there is generalized tetanus, neonatal tetanus for two, 14 days after birth, local tetanus, and uh, cephalic or cephalic tetanus. Uh, both vaccination and the tetanus in immunoglobulin are recommended and are the only treatment for such patient, in addition to the supportive management. As I said, the patient needs supportive management from every, for everything. Uh, the wound would be cleaned and any dead tissue must be removed. Uh, we can give metronidazole is the best. We can give diazepam. Penicillin really blamed. It may be provoke some convulsions and so we not like it. Severe tetanus, we can inject the human tetanus, immunoglobulin inject intracetal. You can inject it intracetal. Increase the clinical improvement from 4% to 35%. Tracheotomy and the mechanical ventilation for three to four days and caring patient on ventilation is very important. Severe tetanus also, the magnesium sulfate is very important in such situations. And I saw many patients not responding to even muscle relaxant and we 
we enforce it to increase our doses of muscle relaxants. The magnesium is really good, give, give us a dramatic response in such patients. And we give it through infusion, one gram, two grams, three grams, every hour for such patients. Very important in addition to benzodiazepine. As you know, benzodiazepine action is muscle relaxation. In addition to anti-anxiety, anti-apprehension, and improving the patient situations and ameliorating some uh, side effect of the psychological problems. Severe tetanus also, the dysautonomia is, as I said, is very problematic. And so you have to arm yourself with leptadol, beta blocker, magnesium, clonidine, infipine, uh, and other drugs as by diazepam and muscle relaxants, very important. The other uh, disease uh, which I want to uh, mention here, my scenic, my scenic graves or my scenic crisis, and in my scenic patient, as you know, there is antibodies. As you know, there is antibody against the acetyl receptors post-synaptic uh, to differentiate it from the Lambert uh, syndrome, which is pre-synaptic block. Uh, in my scenic syndrome, uh, the patient becoming a feature of weakness in fatigability and going effort rapidly provoke worsening weakness, strength improve with rest, fluctuation of severity over time. The patient becoming in the morning, going up in the morning, very good, well, and uh, by time, he becoming uh, weak and he can't swallow, he can't speak, he can't smile, he can't open his eyes, drawing and so on. And so there is some sort, there is here both titanic, both the titanic fate, not both the titanic potentiation as in Lambert syndrome. Lambert syndrome, which affects the calcium channels, affect the presynaptic, it responded to electrophysiological study, there is post titanic potentiation. But in my scenic uh, crisis, post titanic fate, the patient uh, exhausted by repeated stimulations. Uh, patient exhibiting normal sensations, normal deep tender reflexes, not like Barry syndrome normal pupillary uh, reflexes. Uh, only eye deviation, you see here, deviation of eye and the dropping of eyelid in a person with mycelia uh, graves trying to open her eyes. Uh, antibody accelerate degradation of acetylcholine receptors, decreasing the number of receptors on the both synaptic membrane. Uh, distributions eye and the bulbar muscles tend to be affected, involved early, and only skeletal muscles are involved, not the pupils. Generalized weakness can also occur and involving diaphragm and the lamp after that in some patients. Diagnosis of myxenia gravis, we can give uh, just the anti acetylcholine uh, it is the anti acetylcholine antibody, since they the 80%, or no detectable antibody, zero negative mycenia could be diagnosed in some of patients to not accepting the anti acetylcholine antibody we can't find, but the diagnosis is uh, or the uh, zero negative mycenae graves. Diagnosis of mycenae graves also eyes back test is very important and very simple and uh, carry a high sensitivity and high specificity value. Just you put eyes on the upper eyelid it would potentiate the action of the uh, receptors and the patient start to strong strengthen the muscle and the patient start to raise his head and becoming improved. The other test, which is pharmacological hydrophonia, as you know, it is a short acting uh, anti cholinic stress. Uh, you give it two milligrams. If not effective after two, one to two minutes, you can increase to eight milligrams, but take care of its drawbacks uh, bradycardia, uh, so, some sort of uh, cholinergic uh, stimulation. Uh, and we have to differentiate between mycenic crisis and cholinergic crisis. Because as you know, my scenic patient is treated by anticholinesterases, the enzyme which distracts the acetylcholine to give chance to acetylcholine to build up at the neuromuscular junction and so to potentiate the action at the acetylcholine receptors. If you give too much doses of acetylcholine sterase inhibitors like idrifonium, biridostigmine, neustigmine, you will predispose your patient to another crisis, which is cholinergic crisis which looks like organophosphate poisoning, which occur in the ore and we treat it by atropine and raledipsime and so on, which I think you remember, most of you remember the Gulf War and we started to arm ourselves by this item of drugs, raledipsime and atropine to antagonize organophosphate poison. And so there are two main problems in my scenic patient, my scenic crisis and 
cholinergic crisis. Mycenic crisis result from the disease itself, exaggerated disease, uh, exaggerated inhibition of the acyclic receptors, cholinergic crisis, exaggerated response to or excessive dose of anticholinesterase drugs like hydrofonium and viridostimine and mustamine. Hydrofonium is a short acting, and so we diagnose with it. If it, it gives improvement, the patient, of course, okay, suffering from mycenic uh, crisis or mycenia, the graves. If the patient is not responding, is this patient to not mycenic and we have to see for another problems. Uh, treatment and in such a situation in mycenic patient, we use by ribostimine, which is a long acting, long acting anticholinesterase and exhibiting less side effect, less cholinergic side effect than neostigmine. And it could be taken orally and the dose from 60 to 120 milligram every day or every 12 hours or we can increase. Every patient really read, need manipulation of the dose, need, need titrating the dose of the anticholinesterase for him, especially after operation, especially after cymectomy. The patient may take 120 milligram per day or twice daily before the operation, before cymectomy. After cymectomy, you have to manipulate the dose uh, requirements. Otherwise, you will introduce your patient or produce cholinergic tries. Also, in addition, we don't for, forget the plasmapheresis in such patients, which is uh, very important, especially before, especially before cymectomy, we prefer to make plasma phases, and the, uh, also other immune suppressive therapy to decrease the total concentration of OT and antibodies which are present. We have three minutes left, Prof. Oh, I am always unlucky, Dr. Uh, uh, the time is uh, tight. Uh, really, I wanted to speak about another problem in uh, our ICU muscle disease as botulism, as muscle disease itself, as Duchenne atrophy or polymyositis or critical illness, uh, critical illness myopathy or critical illness uh, neuro, uh, neuropathy uh, and the other diseases which affect the neuromuscular unit in our ICU. But I think the time is not enough as usual. And so I have to stop at this point. And don't forget in cholinergic crisis to use glycopyrrolate or hyoxiamine because it is less in its, in its blocking and its side effect if the patient manifesting excessive cholinergic crisis. Steroids may be used but gradual using of steroid in mycenia or start by small dose or wait till the patient exhibiting improvement and then start steroids to enhance the clearance of antibodies. Cymectomy is very essential and for mycenic crisis, but we have to prepare the patient with the cymectomy plasma phases. Uh, uh, the, some ask if we can use high, high flow nasal uh, high flow nasal caster or bipap to mycenic patients, we can in the early stages, but not in patient deteriorating and exhausted. We can't use bipap or high flow nasal caster in exhausted patients. We can use it in early states of mycenic, uh, mycenic patient exhibiting some breathing difficulty just to enhance the breathing bar, but after that, we have to, if the patient deteriorates, we have to intubate and <coughs> treat the patient. Uh, decision to intubation, intubation is a clinical, as I said, clinical decision, not uh, depend on spirometry or blood gases or vital capacity or negative respiratory pressure or forced respiratory pressure, depend on clinical evaluation, don't wait tell patient accepting hypercapnia. This is a late, extremely late finding in this context. Uh, and I think enough <coughs> uh, this uh, our talk today about Barry and our and also our openness and my scene. We both to autism and other disorders to next lecture. Uh, thank, thank you, Rob. You. We'll go to Barbara because we have no time and uh, great pleasure to have you Rob tonight. Uh, Barbara, all yours now. Thank you uh, for that wonderful lecture, Professor. It's wonderful. Um, I think we have a couple questions for you. Um, here is the first question. 
Um, let me see. You ha it says, Professor, you have mentioned that the rate of plasma exchange would be 200 to 250 milliliters per kilogram for five sessions. Is that right? Yes, over five. What an autoimmune disease? An autoimmune disease. We always use it in five in five sessions. Some using it for six sessions or seven sessions. But the research work proving or the most of the trials. Uh, uh, no difference between six and the five the session or more sessions, five is enough. Okay, thank you. This, there's a second question. It says, Professor, is there any specific nutritional support in muscle weakness syndrome? Really, these are good, these are good questions. In, in a patient with muscle disease, they, have, they need more protein requirement, more protein content, more uh, vitamins like uh, vitamin B1, B12, folic acids, they need some trace, uh, need some trace element. Uh, also high calorie diet, they need more calorie diet because the catabolism here in the muscle disease is very high. And so they may need, the adult may need 3,000, 3,500 uh, kilocalorie per, uh, per day.